business as usual, right? They say smile. Okay, so we've we've a and so the point I was making by the number of diseases, not just cancer and leukemia, but diabetes, premature aging in children, increased incidence of cataracts, increased incidence of severe congenital anomalies that we've seen in Chernobyl, and in fact, today I'm going to interview a pediatrician who is a specialist in teratology, meaning damage to fetuses. Um, about the the incidence of congenital anomalies around Chernobyl, which is still ongoing, incidentally. We'll be seeing that around Fukushima for sure in the population. So we're not just talking about malignancies. There are many other diseases related to radiation exposure. And so what I wanted to point out as a physician is that the expense to the Japanese government and the people in general to care for these people and try and treat them is going to be enormous and that is not being factored into the accident at the moment. Right. No, I think you're absolutely right. And you know, on top of that is the, is the generational genetic damage. Uh, oh, yeah. There was a study out just last week about the, the radioactive butterfly uh, damage, and uh, um, the, the, what they're finding is that in successive generations, the genetic damage is getting worse. Uh, so that three generations of butterflies seem to have more genetic damage than the first, the first generation. So, um, um, you know, there's obviously a lot more study needs to be done here, but um, we're looking at, uh, you know, a damaged gene pool uh, that won't manifest itself in 10 years or 20 years. It will manifest itself in a generation or two. That, that's the most serious part of the accident and of anything nuclear. It's called genomic progression, genomic progression. Um, now, I've got some other questions, Arnie. You said earlier in the accident that, that a lot of hydrogen was building up in the buildings units 1, 2, and 3, and they were injecting nitrogen into the buildings to dilute the hydrogen so there would not be a hydrogen explosion. Is the hydrogen still building up? Um, well, they, and they failed. I mean, unit one, two, three, and four um, all blew up uh, from hydrogen explosions. Um, um, they may have had different causes and things like that. And I believe unit three started as a hydrogen explosion, but then became something called a prompt moderated criticality, which is worse. Um, uh, interesting. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm taking a little bit off topic here, but. Um, there was a Japanese study which is now calling the explosion in Unit 3 a detonation, not a deflagration. And that has to do with the speed at which the wave front traveled. And there's no containment in the world that can withstand a detonation shockwave. So um, that's something the nuclear industry doesn't want to address. But uh, we, we now have um, a TMI had an explosion, but it was a deflagration. Unit 1 at Fukushima had an explosion, but it was a deflagration, a slower-moving shockwave. But Unit 3's explosion now, you know, by authorities other than Arne Gunderson, are now calling it a detonation. Meaning and that? Well, that means that the shockwave travels faster than the speed of sound, and it cracks the concrete or yeah, the but steel. What's, but what caused the explosion? You were saying it probably wasn't a hydrogen explosion. Was it a nuclear excursion? Well, it's not, I, I think it's something called a prompt moderated criticality. What's that? It, it, it's not a nuclear bomb. A nuclear bomb, the, the rate at which the explosion grows is it doubles every millionth of a second. Um, a prompt moderated criticality doubles every thousandth of a second. You know, it's still a blink of an eye, but uh, the, the, what you saw at, uh, at Unit um, three, 3 um, was a... Uh, a slower doubling than a nuclear bomb, but much faster than uh, nuclear reactors are designed to So handle. was it a moderated nuclear explosion? The moderated means that the neutrons left the, the uranium atom uh, very fast, but then they, they bumped into water and they attenuated and became what we call thermal neutrons. We're really getting into a lot of nuclear physics here, but the, the net effect is that the growth rate of the explosion in Unit 3 was was moderated, which means it doubled every thousandth of a second. But it was a so nuclear in, in a, explosion. It wasn't not hydrogen, but nuclear. Would you say that? 
In my opinion, it was a prompt moderated criticality. Which I'm not going to call it a nuclear explosion because that, that would be a prompt unmoderated criticality, and, and I don't believe that happened. Uh, you know, but it the, was the related bomb, to the nuclear fuel. Yes, but it was it, the rate at which it grew. I won't call it a nuclear explosion. Okay, you're being very careful, Arnie. <laughs> but you still <laughs> haven't uh, you still haven't answered my question. Is hydrogen still building up in units one, two, ah, and three? Please. You're right. I haven't answered. Yes, uh, hydrogen still is building up um, because of electrolysis with water. The the gamma rays from the fuel are crashing into water and uh, creating oxygen and hydrogen. So they still have to inject nitrogen into those vessels all the time. Oh. Um, so you'll see that, um, uh, as a matter of fact, just recently they put a little bit too much nitrogen in and they wound up with these puffs of radiation coming out. If they put in too much, um, they'll squeeze too much radiation out. So they're trying to maintain the nitrogen without forcing more and more radiation out. But the containments are leaking like sieves, and, and uh, again, for five or six or seven years, um, they are going to continue to create hydrogen, and the only way to, to prevent that from exploding again is to, um, is to feed in nitrogen, which is inert. So there, therefore, still is a risk of a hydrogen explosion in Units 1, 2, or 3? Yes. My God. What about steam explosions? You talked about that initially to Arnie Gunderson. Yeah, the, the decay heat is now low enough um, that, um, the, 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 um, uh, that the blob is sort of hot but solid as opposed to molten. Uh, so uh, we won't get steam explosions at this point. We're uh, far enough along in the accident where these blobs of nuclear fuel are still physically hot, but not hot enough to, um, uh, to turn into molten lava anymore. Okay. Now, how much radiation would you estimate is still escaping every day from Units 1, 2, and 3, which are leaking like sieves, to quote you? Oh, geez. Um, I'm sure it's... Um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if it's a billion becquerels a day. Um, from you know, from both water and and gaseous, so uh, you know, a billion disintegrations per second of radiation um, in a day. And of course, once that billion leaks out, it's going to continue to to decay, but just not in the reactor as it moves around the world. It will uh, continue to decay. Now, a billion is a big number, but the the initial accident had uh, you know about twelve more zeros behind it. So Compared to the first day or week of the initial accident, it's small, but compared to an operating nuclear plant where everything is just fine, it's huge. A billion so, um, becquerels per day, because you said a billion disintegrations per second. That's not a billion becquerels per day. No, a billion disintegrations per second per day. So every um, day they're going to they're going to be releasing about a billion becquerels of, uh, of radiation. Oh, one billion uh, becquerels. Okay, because yeah. a becquerel is a becquerel is a billion a disintegration dis per second. A disintegration per second. So, uh, so initially, what was the size of the release? You say you've oh god, it had fifteen zeros behind it. Uh, so I don't even know what that one, number two, is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think nine, they, they're measuring 10, it in petabecquerel. Um, What's a terabecquerel? That's 15 zeros. 15 zeros. It was like 100,000 petabecquerel. So it's pushing 20 zeros worth of, uh, of zero. You know, 20 just, uh, zeros. 20, 20 zeros. Yeah. Per I put a day. one with 20 zeros behind it, and that's roughly. Uh, I don't have my calculator here with me, Helen, but it's, uh, it's, it was, was 100,000. Um, Peta becquerels. Now, peta is 10 to the 15. Peta. Peta. Peta becquerels. Yeah. So that's 1 by 10 to the 20. 1 by 10 to the 20. Roughly, yeah. Becquerels. It's 1 by 10 to the 18th. It really doesn't matter. It's such a huge number. Um, and what are the, what what are the elements pro producing that extraordinary amount of radiation? Well, Name you know, them. Uh, 
initially, the initial burst, of course, were xenon and krypton noble gases, and you and I talked about that, and they're fat-soluble, and you use them in, uh, in hospitals. Yes. To, um, uh, um, very, and then, of course, very high energy gamma emitters, yes. Yes. Then, of course, after that comes the iodine. Um, now, that only has an eight-day half-life, but it's selectively absorbed by, um, uh, by thyroids. There's a good study out, uh, I think, last week that shows in Hiroshima victims, the kids continue to have thyroid problems, you know, up into their 50s and 60s and 70s. So um, the, it used to be thought that if you got through the first couple of years, you're out of the woods. But for the children who are, you know, whose thyroids are growing, um, um, apparently that's not true and that they're seeing continual thyroid problems uh, essentially for life for the kids that were uh, attached, uh, who had the... Yes, they the, still... Uh, the, yeah. the children in Hiroshima and Nagasaki who were affected mostly by external gamma radiation, there wasn't a lot of internal radiation from radioactive iodine, even now, so many years later, how many years is it? It's 45, it's uh, well, 50, 60, 60 years later, are still yeah, developing 68. thyroid cancers. And... Um, one third of thyroid cancers metastasize and kill their the patients. Um, so, but we're also now seeing within the first eighteen months after Fukushima, they've examined eighteen thousand children under the age of fifteen or eighteen in Fukushima Prefecture. 30, no, 38,000, sorry, 38,000 or so, and 36% of them are th showing thyroid cysts and or nodules by ultrasound examination, and they are not being biopsied to see if the cells are malignant. That is a really gross medical irresponsibility, um, and they're downplaying it, and they're not uh, really informing the parents what it means. Um, but the number I heard in comparison is a, a normal population of children of that age has 1%. 1%. So clearly yeah. these kids are, are this off is 36%, the chart. With the, it's off the chart. But it's early, Siana. You don't expect to see in, in, uh, here in uh, Chernobyl, they didn't see thyroid tumors until three to four years post-accident. This is in the first 18 months. So therefore you would assume that these children got a whopping dose of radioactive iodine into their thyroid glands by inhalation and ingestion of contaminated food. Um, right. and, and that's the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. That, that indicates that lots of other cancers are going to start developing too from internal emitters that get into their livers, their heart, their brain, their muscles, their bones, and the like. Yes, and it, it um, you know, and also we, we talked about noble gases, we talked about iodine, and all of the other ones, uh, which everybody seems to lump into cesium, but it's cesium-134, cesium-137, it's, uh, you know, strontium and rubidium and on and on and on. Um, well, you know, you give us, you're a nuclear engineer. Give us some of the others. Just name them, Arnie, so people well, have an I'm idea. Most I'm most concerned about uranium. We're finding uranium in samples, which indicates, you know, fuel melt and stuff like that. And, and as a heavy element, we're surprised to be able to, to pick it up, uh, you know, a couple hundred miles away. One of the samples I took in Tokyo had uranium in it. 